it really shows the fear and vulnerability of the upper classes. Uh, at the same time, it's used to demean and, and destroy the lower classes. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute whatever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone. Thank you so much for joining me on The No Show. I'm really pleased to have you. Thank you. I'm pleased to be here. Um, so we are really excited to be talking to you today um, for many reasons, but uh, because of the fact that you are um, an academic who has such a diverse past, um, you've looked at all sorts of things. And so I want you to sort of talk us and talk our audience through um, your journey in academia. Where did you start and what was what captivated you at the beginning and sort of how that evolved over time? Okay. Well, I, I went to UCLA for my PhD and uh, studied under Dr. Amos Funkenstein, was his name, uh, in cultural and intellectual history. So I began as a historian of ideas. And my first book was about a French priest and philosopher, a contemporary of Descartes, um, in fact, he, Gassendi and Descartes had a very fraught relationship. Mm -hmm. uh, Gassendi uh, was a priest, and so what he was doing was he was Christianizing Epicurean atomism, the idea that the universe is made out of little tiny atoms floating in the void. Uh, Epicurus in the ancient world had no theological explanation for this. It just, it just was. Uh, Gassendi argued that uh, God created the atoms in the void, uh, started uh, the mechanical universe, which is the, is the word they used for it, which was atoms hitting each other and eventually becoming masses and planets and the solar system. They were. They also knew the work of Galileo very well. So they were talking about that in the heliocentric universe. So I was also a historian of science. Um, mm. It's one of my fields. Uh, I did, a, I looked at Gassendi's ethics to see how he could possibly uh, make uh, Epicurean atomism into an ethical theory. And uh, the idea, the ancient idea is human beings should not be afraid of death because they just become atoms again. Uh, and they should seek tranquility of the mind. That was the idea, tranquility. So what Gassendi said was God created all of this but human beings are different from the rest of creation because God gave us reason, the ability to calculate what would bring us the greatest amount of pleasure or happiness in the long run and the least amount of pain. Mm -hmm. And he argued we human beings who were rational and thought about things would come to the conclusion that essentially uh, death doesn't matter. We shouldn't be afraid of it because we'll go to heaven after death and human beings should seek tranquility, should not be disturbed by what's going on. And human beings um, have only a probable knowledge 
of anything and out of the probable knowledge they pick what is the most probable possibility for tranquility mm -hmm. and lack of pain in the body and so that's what that book was about so, so you started off with Gassendi so before we move on from Gassendi and and or, or talk about Gassendi a little bit more what sort of struck you about Gassendi that made you think actually let me look into this character a bit more well uh, my advisor suggested that I do the book and do do work on him and so boy at that time my Latin was rudimentary but I sat down and started to translate. I've always been very, very interested in the history of religion, uh, particularly the history of Christianity. And so that I was very interested in the idea that a Catholic priest would try to Christianize this ancient atheistic philosophy and mm. everybody thought everybody at Gassendi's time, early 17th century, thought that Epicurus was the arch atheist in the history of humankind. And so I was fascinated with why he picked this particular ancient philosophy. Uh, and uh, now in part, he was, uh, he was, responding to Galileo, and Galileo also had a mechanical universe. He was also a, fr a friend of Thomas Hobbes, and subsequently I've done a lot of work on Hobbes also. And so, you know, the idea of the mechanical universe, matter in motion, how do you introduce God into that system? Um, is is Gassendi the first to introduce God into the system? Into atomism? Yeah. Uh, there are a couple of Italian humanists who also were interested in atomism and tried to reconcile. Uh, Lorenzo Valla was one. Pico della Marandola has a little bit about that in his work. Uh, but Gassendi was the first major one. Uh, Stephen Greenblatt has written a book about Poggio Bracciolini, who also was, in, was interested in atomism and the idea of the swerve for Epicurus, the world building begins when for some unknown reason, one atom swerves from a perpendicular path and hits another atom mm -hmm. and everything starts going. But Gassendi is really the first person to work extensively on the ethical implications of the mechanical philosophy. And so as you look at this sort of ethical grounding in, in what he, his work is, um, what did he bring in terms of ethics that um, I suppose informed the Christian uh, audience at the time? Uh, well, it's mostly the idea that human beings are distinct from the rest of creation because they have rationality. They are not determined in what they do. Right. A lot of the people working with the mechanical philosophy, like Hobbes, came very, very close to a deterministic philosophy that everything that happens has to happen. Mm -hmm. And Gassendi said, no, you can retain the idea of, of matter and motion as long as you recognize that God gives human beings the ability, ability to use reason to calculate what is the best possible course to live a tranquil and an ethical and a good life, a virtuous life. Virtue is the key to gaining tranquility. When you are virtuous, you can become tranquil. Uh, it's, a, it's a very interesting uh, sort of concept because so it, it lends itself to, to quite a few other theories in other fields, um, you yes. know, including, for example, it, like very similarly to economics, for example, where the consumer is very rational and they're going to make the most optimal choices for themselves. Yeah, I think that 
uh, at the end of my Gassendi book, I write a chapter about John Locke. Mm -hmm. He knew Gassendi's ideas and incorporated them into his philosophy. Mm -hmm. now, I'm not going to say that Locke Everything he had to say about ethics came from Gassendi. Locke was an amazing thinker, but he certainly used some of these ideas. David Hume used some of these ideas later on. So, and Adam Smith, you know, the invisible hand and all mm. of that sort of stuff. Uh, some of that you can find in Pierre Gassendi as mm -hmm. well. So, so after you, your work on, on Gassendi, where what sort of um, what, what steered you into the next path? Well, just as a sort of maybe there was one paragraph about this in the Gassendi book, but there was a woman named Margaret Cavendish. She was uh, the Duchess of Newcastle. And she was the first woman to publish extensively on scientific topics in English. Mm -hmm. She could not read Latin, but a lot of Gassendi's ideas were translated by somebody named Walter Charlton, who was Margaret Cavendish's physician. Mm -hmm. So she probably learned a lot about this from him to begin with. And so I became interested in her. I was probably the first person uh, since the mid 20th century in the early 20th century to really look at her work. And she wrote so much. She wrote treatises, she wrote romances, she wrote a parody of the Royal Society, she wrote plays, she wrote poetry. Uh, a lot of this stuff started while she was in exile in Paris and Antwerp during the English Civil War. And um, she, she started writing atomistic poetry while she was there. She mm -hmm. exposed to these ideas about Adams. She wrote, some people will say they're good poems. I think they're awful poems. <laughs> but she wrote a whole bunch of poems about nature and nature as a woman is addressing the four elements that become somehow become atoms and the world is created from these. Uh, there's a major deba debate among Cavett scholars and believe it or not there are now lots of Cavendish scholars about whether her she was an atheist or not I don't think she was I think, mm. I think she wasn't fervent and of course this is also during well the religious wars of the early 17th century and the mid 17th century she were, were going on and she was very well aware of that and so essentially she thought religion it's nice let's put it aside we can't really understand what god is or what god knows and so God becomes largely absent in her thought, uh, but you know that she had to address some of those ideas. Mm -hmm. So I was very interested in that, and I started to read first her poetry, and then her major scientific treatise is called "Observations Upon Experimental Philosophy." And it is a critique of the Royal Society, which was just founded in 1660. Uh, she did not believe that experiment alone could establish any kind of facts. And she attacked the Royal Society and Robert Hooke, uh, the, ultimately the curator of the Royal Society. Uh, about his ideas. So she published her treatise in 1666. 
His work was published in 1665, and it is a very detailed critique of the experimental program of the Royal Society. What was her, I mean, her critique is, is sort of rooted in, in what, what, why is she, why was she so, you know, strongly opposed to, to the method of the Royal Society? Well, she really thought that empiricism, observation, could not establish facts. Instead, um, she believed in what she called sense and reason. And this has a lot to do with the material philosophy she developed. And I don't know if the listeners want to hear about this or not, but she thought there were three different forms of matter, which she calls inanimate, sensitive, and rational matter. Uh, every creature, including human beings, are composed of these different forms of matter, which are so mingled and intermixed, you can't really divide them apart. Mm -hmm. uh, human beings do have an abundance of rational matter. And so when sensitive matter perceives something, it goes to the rational matter of human beings, which then has to analyze what sensitive matter presents. And then we can get some form of knowledge from that. But it's, you know, it's not, experimental mat matter. The Royal Society argued you could not make generalizations. Mm -hmm. You could only observe discrete empirical facts. And she was arguing you could indeed generalize because there is rational matter. That's very interesting. And so, so as I understand it, she, she, she believed in in sort of the concept of the unobservable, what you what you cannot observe, and she sort of allowed yes, allowed right. apart allowed a, allowed for that to exist, whereas the Royal Society didn't. That's correct. That's absolute absolutely true. You could come to some understanding, therefore, beyond the basic empirical fact. You could analyze what human, human beings, she argued, had their own kind of knowledge. And she thought every created being, from rocks to uh, animals, every creature had its own form of knowledge. And consequently, uh, all creatures, everything is equal because each has its own kind of knowledge that mm. it knows about the world, about the created world. Human beings have a specialized kind of knowledge, but using their rationality, their reason, they can understand the nature of the universe and that it's made out of matter in motion. And she there's another, another argument about how much gender issues affected her work. Uh, she does um, anthropomorphize a lot. So she talks about a female nature organizing created being in the created world. Uh, you know, once again, God has gone on vacation or something. <laughs> He's not involved. Uh, and you know, part of my work was she does have this anthropomorphized nature figure who is female. And she argues that females do have a certain kind of knowledge that men might not have. Um, they're good at, uh, well, at what she calls natural knowledge as opposed to artificial knowledge. Artificial knowledge is stuff like, well, as experiments, but natural knowledge is knowledge you gain through your rationality. And um, so, she, you know, the question is, is this a feminized world that she is uh, envisioning? 
to some extent, I argue it is, but nature, as well as being an anthropomorphic organizer of matter, um, also can be viewed as the conglomerated matter itself. In some mm -hmm. ways, it's both nature is both exterior and inter interior in the world. It's, mm -hmm. uh, it's an organizing principle that it can just be part of matter itself. Although she talks about nature, feminine nature, who's good at making pies and pies. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's a very interesting concept because I think it, it lends itself to example, um, for, exa for example, to, to someone like um, Nikolai Tesla, who, <laughs> Who who, bur who, uh, who leans on this concept quite quite heavily because he says you know the intuitive mind is far more powerful than the, than the learning mind. Absolutely, intuition is very basic to this kind of knowledge, and you know I don't know much about Tesla, but yeah, intuition plays a very big part of it. But you know, it she was very. She really wanted the other thinkers of her time to engage with her on these ideas. And of course they wouldn't because she was a woman. And mm. some of them, it's interesting what she does. She uh, sends copies of her books to the universities to read. Now she's a duchess, so they send back very respectful kinds of thank you notes for, for the material. Uh, but other other thinkers like Robert Boyle and and others dismiss her ideas out of hand. They just and she was exceedingly eccentric. I have to say, although some Cavendish scholars would would take exception to that, but she was a very unusual woman, and one of the most interesting things she did. It was to get an invitation to come to the Royal Society to see some of their experiments. And essentially she went, her, her visit to the Royal Society became a spectacle. She was attended by lots of people. People were aware of her because of her social class mm -hmm. and crowds gathered to see her procession into the Royal Society. And they greeted her and then they performed several uh, experiments, including the air pump, Robert Boyle's air pump that could create a vacuum. And her response was, oh, that's amazing, that's amazing, that's amazing. By which, you know, she essentially was saying she was, this, these are toys that boys are playing with. <laughs> that which she says in her, in the book. It, it, her I mean, uh, it's also kind of, um, I mean, would you argue because of her eccentricity that she, she was dismissed because of that or just purely because of the fact that she's a woman? I think it's also, it's both. Mm -hmm. I and mean, supposedly she wore, um, she wore male clothing occasionally and mm. that was a no-no. And uh, according to Samuel Pepys, uh, she, uh, some women at the time exposed their breasts and so she attended plays with her breasts exposed and rouged uh, uh, and he took exception to that and the most of our knowledge of the reaction to her comes from his account of what she was doing mm -hmm. and uh, she thought she he she was absolutely crazy john evelyn who's a very important thinker of the time uh met her and with his he brought his wife along and his wife really thought that she was crazy uh, so you know it's a combination she was mm -hmm. an extraordinary woman uh she 
the work of hers that is most familiar and is being added to the canon now, you know, the, of dead white males that tried to find a dead white female to add to it. She wrote a kind of science fiction romance called The New Blazing World, in which essentially what she did is she it's a tale of a woman a maiden who is captured and goes across the poles into another world where uh, she the emperor of this other world falls in love with her makes her into the empress the emperor then disappears from the scene like god disappeared and the empress uh, rules and create scientific societies that are made up of lice men, spider men, uh, worm men. And what she's doing is she is, it's a parody of the Royal Society. <laughs> she's taking the creatures they were looking at in that Robert Hooke's book of engravings emphasized, and she makes them into the these subjects in the new blazing world and the empress ultimately decides to dissolve the scientific societies that she's created because of possible turmoil that might come from the scientific it, 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 it sounds i mean it sounds it sounds very interesting and, and i think this also leads us nicely into um you know, talking about the, the meat of, of your work at the moment, which is your book um, mm -hmm. that, that's um, just right. come out or is about to come out. Um, and it's also rooted in looking at the, the Royal Society. So yes. talk to us about, about your book. What is the title of the book? What, excuse me? What, what what's the title of the book? Oh, the, it's called um, Getting Under Our Skin, The Cultural and Social History of Vermin. And the book uh, looks at bedbugs, lice, fleas, and rats. Uh, the lice almost took over the book because there's so much about mm. the, it's just, I guess the best way to put it is to say their metaphoric meeting, meaning mm. how they were, these creatures were used to describe uh, the other. And by the other, that's a very broad category, but it's classist. It's also uh, gendered descriptions of, of women. Uh, it's... Uh, describing uh, Native Americans, Africans, uh, all of those peoples were equated to vermin in various ways. Uh, so for example, uh, lice and Eskimos, according to travelers accounts, Eskimos like to eat lice. And uh, there's one travel account where supposedly, or maybe really, uh, these insects have nutritional value, but mm -hmm. the wives of chieftains would pick the lice off their bodies and from their hair and the Eskimos would eat them. And of course, all of this uh, for the English speaking audience, both in, uh, in England and Scotland and the New World uh, meant that they were barbaric. They were savages mm -hmm. because they were doing this. And so if they are savages, they can be exploited, exterminated, you can do whatever you want to them because they are animals rather than human beings. So this language becomes an effective way for uh, categorizing uh, the others. And by the way, the English, of course, started talking about vermin in terms of the Scots and the Irish. Uh, 
but it's a way to, uh, to, to what's the word I'm looking for, to essentially say it's a-okay to do whatever you want. To uh, it sounds, it sounds to me a lot like it, it's, it's sort of a, a very, um, a very insidious way to, to, to reduce someone's humanity. Um, yeah, it's it it's certainly a, it's a, is. And go ahead. Well, oh, excuse me. Finish. Your no, story. no, go ahead. But it is insidious. And one of the more interesting things uh, that I talk about in the book, it's one of my conclusions, is that it's a way to demean and, and make these people bestial. But it's also there's a lot of fear involved in it. Mm. So the, you know, the upper classes, the conquerors, were always afraid that somehow uh, people will would plant bed bed bugs in their rooms. Slaves would plant bed bugs, or or that somehow lice would contaminate the laundry that people were doing, and therefore contaminate their betters. Um, it really shows the fear and vulnerability of the upper classes. Uh, at the same time, it's used to demean and, and destroy the lower classes. When does this concept, people. sorry, when does this concept begin to come about? Like, is there, is there a, a particular author or a particular publication that is sort of the earliest known a use of like using this language to describe use, using vermin to describe humans. Oh, you know, you can go back to the Spanish really in the uh, 16th and 17th centuries and start to find this language. Um, in English, the 18th century, it really takes off. Uh, so Oliver Goldsmith, uh, writes an encyclopedia about about all of this and uses this kind of language as well. Uh, the travel accounts and uh, I'm, th I'm thinking purchase his pilgrimage, but that was earlier. But it, it's really if you read travel accounts, Hans Sloan. Uh, the, the president of the Royal Society in the later 17th century uses some of this language uh, uh, describing Jamaica. Uh, once, uh, once the Europeans started to take over Africa, uh, they used this language to describe what they call the Hottentots in Southern Africa. Africa, and also um, to some extent northern Africans as well. So, you know, you find it all over the place. Mm. And as I traced this, and this I found really fascinating, by the 19th century, naturalists were starting to write extended books uh, about the natural world, obviously. And many of those books are quite racist, uh, what we would call racist. Mm -hmm. And that, to some extent, leads to Darwin. Uh, Darwin is very familiar with these early accounts of travel books, he he went on the HMS Beagle in the uh, 1830s to the New World and collected specimens and was told by sailors that um, that the natives of Chile had a particular kind of lice which were different than British lice, mm -hmm. and if they if they came on a, an English sailor's skin, they immediately dropped off. They could not uh, 
uh, colonize English skin. Mm -hmm. um, and he also heard the account that uh, English lice, when one was passing the equator, all of the lice jumped off in the Southern Hemisphere mm -hmm. before you got to the Southern Hemisphere. And then when you returned and crossed the equator, all of the English lice ju jumped back on. <laughs> so Darwin was familiar with all of this and he wrote to Agassiz, the geologist who was in the, no in the New World, uh, not the New World any longer, he was in, uh, the colonies in the United States and asked him to collect some lice so he could look at them and see whether they were really different mm -hmm. than European lice. And he, now his ultimate aim was to show that all, all humans all evolve a unitary evolution and we are all the same and we all have the same kind of lice. So mm -hmm. that's why he wanted to look at these creatures. And you know, he ultimately thought we all had the same kind of lice. It, it's so interesting to see that these uh, creatures are the subject of, of sort of so much oh, yes. intense study and, and interest. Um, why, the, why more than others? Why, why, these, why vermin more than others? Well, you know, I thought originally that um, it was because they were cl closest to human beings. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Robert Hooke, the Royal Society, nobody really has a picture of him, but supposedly he wore his hair natural and long and very greasy. So, you know, my thought is, okay, he picked <laughs> a louse and it was there. Likewise with fleas. They were there. And then uh, bed bugs were not recognized by the English as a separate species until the 18th century, although undoubtedly they were in England before that. But the English argued that lice and particularly lice did not get to England until the English had to import timber from the continent. Mm -hmm. And they came with the timber, or maybe they came with the Huguenots who were fleeing, the French Protestants fleeing to England. And that's when they came. And so, you know, I, to a certain extent, extent I thought that these, that they were interested in these creatures because they were so accessible. But mm -hmm. naturalists were interested in other creatures as well. And I, you know, I didn't go into a study of the metaphoric meaning of other creatures. Uh, I know people loved butterflies and they were fascinated with, um, with a lot of the insects in the New World. There were, uh, what's her name, Marianne, published a book of illustrations that are beautiful in the early 18th century. And so they were very interested in, in the other creatures they found in the New World, the other bugs and animals, but the negative connotations that went back to an earlier period certainly continued. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and I think one of the things that sort of um, may be an explanation as to why this language um, continued is, you know, our, our sort of negative or discomfort feelings or feelings of pain are far more poignant than our feelings of like joy and satisfaction. And so using the language of like, vermin to, to, to describe that and to sort of uh, home in on, on a particular problem that they might see for themselves um, is, is an easy continuation of it. Yeah, I think you're right. And, um, you know, the idea that you couldn't sleep comfortably 
because of bed bugs. Mm -hmm. There's one English woman in the mid 18th century who essentially advises travelers who are going on the grand tour. They started doing that to bring their own linen, linen and to uh, put leather around it. Very similar to the way people are supposed to not put uh, their luggage on the floor anymore because mm. of bed bugs. Uh, that was the idea that uh, you know you could be you could suffer the pain of bed mm. bug bites or lice bites. But you know it's all it's more than pain. It's also an indication of social class. So as I follow this into the 20th century. Uh, you know, all of those young English soldiers who found themselves in the trenches of World War I, all of a sudden, they had been brought up on an ethic of cleanliness. You know, cleanliness became a really big deal in the 18th century. Mm to signify the upper classes from the lower classes. And so here are these upper class lieutenants in the trenches with everybody else. And, and the trenches are crawling with lice and with rats as well. And you there are many letters and soldiers' accounts of all of this where they hate the lice more than they hate the Germans. And they write poetry about it. Uh, Sassoon and, and Rosenberg and others write poems about the lice. And one of the interesting things that I haven't spoken about, but um, entrepreneurs got into the pest killing business very early. Mm. So the first exterminator set up his business in 1730, exterminating bed bugs. Uh, and there were many exterminators and pest killers in the decades that followed. During World War I, the uh, entrepreneurs started to sell <laughs> sell belts that were full of insecticide, which would supposedly keep the lice away. Mm -hmm. And um, there were all sorts of things. Some of them contained stuff that are in modern insecticides, mm -hmm. perithrum and, and other uh, killers uh, of insects. So some of them may have been a little bit effective with effective with this stuff, but it's it's really pretty fascinating. And you know by World War One, of course, uh, germ theory had been discovered in the late 19th century. And so people knew that fleas were the insect vector for bubonic plague. Mm. Lice are, is, are the insect vector for typhus. So they, there was also a concern about disease as well. Um, in fact, uh, Tolkien, the Lord of the Rings, and C.S. Lewis, Narnia, uh, some of their descriptions are about, come from World War I and the trenches and mm -hmm. the dead bodies. Uh, Tolkien and Lewis uh, both caught a less virulent form of typhus, which probably saved their lives because they were sent home rather than having to stay in the trenches and get mm -hmm. killed. Uh, whoops, something oh, just went ding dong. Uh, so, you know, it, it's interesting. And then, of course, you know, 
if I get to extend this DDT during World War II mm. um, was used extensively in around Rome. Everybody knows about malaria, malaria mosquitoes being killed about Rome, but also they were used to kill other creatures as well. And after the war, uh, these chemicals were sold uh, particularly to women to protect their children from, mm -hmm. from bed bugs, lice, fleas. And people were studying rats as well, too, by that time, very extensively. And so entrepreneurs got into it. You could buy wallpaper impregnated with this stuff and to correct, to protect your little babies. It, it, it's, it's very interesting to, there's, there's a sort of, there's a very interesting thread here when it comes to entrepreneurs and, and also lending itself back to, to sort of the negative connotations of the language. Um, because, you know, even, even today, you know, like you rightly pointed out um, that, you know, politicians and media from, around the world not just in the us and the uk but but predominantly like it is taking hold here in the us and and in the uk where you know uh, immigrants are described as vermin as a, a, a in, as an infestation as you know all the, yeah. the, the exact same language but i think you, i find it very ironic that you know you pointed out that um uh, you uh, you touch on the fact that the, during the bed bug crisis that, you know, an exterminator goes to Jamaica and from a former slave, you know, from the, the so-called vermin gets, the, gets the, 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 you know, solution to two bed bugs. Yeah, there's a great deal of irony involved in that. And he, uh, Southall tells the story in great detail and he, in 1729, I guess he was there. And supposedly this former slave came up to him and observed that he was covered with welts and said to him, you, an Englishman, you know, how can you possibly be covered with welts like that? And uh, tells him that he has this stuff that will pr protect against bed bugs. And so Southall goes and, and plies him with drink to get the formula, which he gets from him. But you know, it's interesting the way he, Southall writes about this whole story in his pamphlet, which is meant to sell his product when he gets back to England. And in a way, he's doing this to get into the idea of native knowledge that they somehow, oh, this is a, a, a magi of some kind, that he has the special knowledge, he's closer to nature mm -hmm. and has this kind of knowledge. There's lots of irony mm -hmm. involved in all of this. Uh, there's another oh and by the way his book is dedicated to a member of the upper classes and all of the exterminators afterwards dedicate try to get you know the approval of the upper classes by saying that duke so and so thinks this is a wonderful idea okay and uh it, but it's it's really it's it's, I was fascinated by his treatise. He also, he, Seth Hall is trying to make his way into the birth of, of science. And so he, his book contains uh, in, an engraving showing American lice versus European lice and looking at their different sizes uh, because they are somehow different in the different continents. And then he explains that you can't just uh, 
kill the living bed bug, you have to get the nits or the larva of bed bugs, which are quiescent during the winter months. So if you really want to get rid of bed bugs, you have to employ his services mm, during the winter time. And he will go into the walls and into the bedsteads. And by the way, the English start, stopped using wood for bedsteads and started using steel in order to avoid bed bugs. Uh, but he would do that or for one shilling, they could buy his pamphlet and buy some of his product and try to do it themselves. But if they really wanted to get rid of their bed bugs, they should hire him to do yeah. it and his workers. Uh, I think I think this book has so much in it. I mean, I mean, for me personally, sitting here speaking to you, I think there there are so many gems that sort of speak to our society in general about how we've come to we've come to understand the other, or we've come to become we've almost become you know bystanders bystanders in this attack by the media against the other and 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 i think this book really gives a solid grounding as to sort of how that that language and that attitude evolved over time so i think it's a fantastic sort of insight for anyone that's that's looking to 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 really get to grips with how we how we how we're sort of shaping our our thinking or how the media is shaping our thinking so i think it's a fantastic bit of research and it's 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 rich in sort of cultural elements yeah that's what, what i hope to get across in the book and uh, make people more aware of how these this kind of language and rhetoric can infiltrate their own thinking the way they view the other and you know, it's certainly not just the English speaking peoples, uh, the, in the Tutsi called the Hutu cockroaches. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it just, it's this kind of rhetoric affects people's thinking and how they feel, think about other people. There was an account on uh, Fox News. Um, I, I don't know if your listeners know much about Fox News, but it's the conservative uh, news outlet. And it's, well, it's uh, very biased. Um, if I swear. <laughs> yes. And uh, so one of the anchors was reporting about a woman who had observed lice in the hair of immigrant children. And shouldn't people be very careful to put these children on planes because then they would infest, of course, the plane people would get lice. Mm -hmm. And so this is a way to justify closing the borders, protecting it, us from it's, life. It's, it, and then the, you really get a real sense for like the who is still deeply rooted in their colonial past and who's really sort oh, of yes. in touch with with that with that world. And it's like we see it here on a daily basis. And it's not just describing, you know immigrants is sometimes describing segments of society in the UK who are British citizens who just happen to be of a different skin color. Oh, yes. I, uh, Indian, Brits, Pakistanis, everybody. Um, you know, it's interesting during World War Two in the uh, bomb shelters and the upper class is having to share a space with the lower classes mm -hmm. and they use this language also. It, it, it's, it's fascinating, it's absolutely fascinating and, I, and I really, I've really enjoyed um, speaking to you and sort of getting your, your, your insights on the book. Um, so when is the book out or is it out already? No, the uh, publication date is September 21st. Um, and uh, you can pre-order on Amazon. Yeah. yeah, 
Uh, so it's that's what it's going to be out. So for all our audience who who are, who are interested in the, in the book, what we'll do is we'll, we'll leave a link um, on the description um, on on the videos and on the audio, um, and uh, follow the link um, pre-order. Um, and and you know when when the book is out, we'd we'd like to do you know uh, another sort of highlight about about the book. But I think it's so. I mean, I can't express how important this is in terms of understanding where this language comes from and understanding sort of when we understand this language, we understand how to defend ourselves against it and how to yeah. not participate in, in sort of, you know, the proliferation of this language and sort of, you know, calling people out who use this language. So I think you've done an amazing job and I'm, I'm really pleased to have spoken <laughs> Thank to you. you. Well, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure. Um, thank you so much. And, and I hope to have you on um, sometime soon for more research. Okay. Thank you for watching this video. Please help us keep the show alive by liking and sharing this video and by subscribing to the show and making sure the notification button switched on. For those of you who can help a little bit more, there's a Patreon link down below where you can contribute wherever you can. Every little does help and all the money will go directly back into the show. You can also keep up with our latest content on Instagram at The No Show Pod, as you can see on the screen. As you know, The No Show is an initiative designed to make academic research accessible to everyone. So do contribute to the conversation, leave some questions, have a discussion, and I'll make sure I get back to everyone.